Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Peter Knight of the U.S. Army Center of Military History. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today about the importance of unit historical programs and what they mean to your units and to the Army as a whole. We're going to start off this briefing with a brief video testimonial. And I'm going to ask you to pause this video to view the separate video file that features the Commanding General Tradoc, General Paul Funk and his deputy and Major General Brad Gerke of the Army DA G357 to offer their testimonials about unit historical programs. So please view that video at this time and then come back to this video. Having viewed those powerful testimonials from those three general officers, I'm here today to give you as future battalion and brigade commanders critical tools that will enable your success in command. And certainly you can see how those who have preceded you at the various levels of command utilize military history. And I want to empower you to be able to do the same thing. The agenda we'll follow today is what you see listed here. We're going to talk about the utility of unit historical programs and what they do for you as commanders, for your units, and for the Army as a whole. We'll give you some tips on how to build a successful program, the resources that we can make available to you to help you in that, and then also to help you understand where your unit's historical program fits within the larger Army historical program. So why do we need history? Have you ever asked yourself any of these questions that you see listed on the slide? Have you ever asked yourself, has this happened before? How has this been done in the past? Why did we make the decisions we did? Do you want your soldiers to learn about their unit's history and operations and be inspired by them? Have you ever wondered if your unit's awards or campaign participation credit is correct and current? Have your soldiers transitioning from the Army struggled to access their VA benefits? Have you ever been challenged to deploy a unit to a new or different area of responsibility? If your answers to any of these questions are yes, then you need a unit history program. Major General Todd McCaffrey, who was the former chief of staff at Africa Command, once said, when I became a general officer, no one taught me how to use a historian. The good news for all of you is you're not going to have to wait that long. We're going to equip you with what you need to know now so that you can leverage the power of military history in your units. Historical programs are for commanders. And so what does a unit history program do for you? It does four key things. History inspires. It inspires your soldiers by building a sense of unit identity, unit pride, esprit de corps, and exemplifying the Army values. History informs. It allows soldiers to, to absorb through professional development the, the details of military history that pertain to their own role in the Army today. It hones their critical thinking skills, their ability to build perspective, to understand not just the perspective of the squad leader in the U.S. forces, but to also understand the adversary's perspective and to put all of those things together to enable them to think better, to think more deeply, to help them build their problem solving skills. It allows them to substantiate their service claims when their careers have run their course, whether they serve two years in the Army or 22 years. They deserve to be able to substantiate their service and access the VA benefits that they've earned over many years of dedicated service. History implements. History can be a, made a part of the military decision-making process to inform your staff planning, to help answer requests for information, for you to be able to go back and see, have we encountered similar problems in the past and how did we go about addressing those problems? History integrates. It allows soldiers to become a true part of the unit, whether it's at the unit's activation ceremony or perhaps even inactivation. Or to, or to be a part of the lineage and honors and the campaign credit and unit decorations that the unit earns in various operations throughout the world. It makes soldiers a part of the unit's achievements collectively. And most importantly, it tells the soldier's story. At the U.S. Army Center of Military History, our job is to write the official history of the U.S. Army. And our ability to write that history to tell the story of what your soldiers do worldwide 
in the various campaigns that we're involved in is only as good as our ability to collect that information from each of you in your respective unit historical programs. Tips for a successful unit history program start with you assigning a unit historical officer on additional duty orders within your unit. We prefer that that unit historical officer or UHO for short has the skill identifier 5 X-ray Army historian. However, if you have no one with a real history background, then we trust that you'll appoint the right officer or NCO to do the job. You assign that UHO to either your DCO or your XO, and you deconflict the roles of that UHO and their responsibilities with those of the PAO. While PAO has, in some ways, a very similar mission, their, their mission is all about the messaging. For the UHO, the mission is about collecting the information to, to ensure that the unit learns from its history, good, bad, or otherwise, to learn from both its successes and its failures, and to be able to assess all of those objectively. The key duties of the unit historical officer are to collect and maintain documents, media, and artifacts for the organization's historical file, and to prepare an annual unit historical report and submit that report to the higher headquarters, utilizing an online tool set that I've created for them that I'll talk about a little bit more later in the briefing. Those, so collecting and maintaining the documents, media and artifacts and preparing the annual history report are the most important duties of the UHO. In addition to that, if you appoint the right person as a UHO, they can also help you prepare and assemble historical material to aid with operational planning and training. They can also help set up professional development events like staff rides or organize leader professional development sessions or sergeant's time training that could utilize military history. Can also, they can also liaison with other unit historical officers and reach back to the Center of Military History and our subject matter experts uh, to be able to uh, leverage our expertise. Moving on to the topic of UHO training. Uh, we will certainly work with your UHOs to ensure that they are equipped and, and ready to do their jobs. There are several means by which we can do this. There is a distance learning course called the A625 Field and Unit Historian Distance Learning Course administered by the Combined Arms Center that allows UHOs to work towards earning Skill Identifier 5 X-ray. That course is worth three credit hours. It is taught by Mr. Gary Linhart. And it's, simp it's as simple as going to the web link and enrolling in the course. We are also working on a new two-day distance learning course for unit historical officers called UHO Fundamentals. It will go live hopefully by fiscal year 22. That'll be a two day distance learning course that is the bare bones uh, course that the UHOs will need to do their jobs. UHOs can also contact uh, the Center of Military History. Uh, you can contact me uh, and, and we'll set up some one on one training as needed. UHOs should also undergo foreign disclosure officer training before deployment. One of the biggest uh, challenges we have as we collect information from downrange is making sure that we can declassify it and that all of the equities that are involved in coalition operations with foreign nations, allied partners, and so on, that we can address all of those equities and screen that information to be able to declassify it quickly. So UHOs being trained in foreign disclosure officer uh, procedures is extremely helpful in that process. Moving on to Army history websites. Uh, listed here are some key websites that will be of great use to you, and I recommend that you navigate to those websites to, re to refer to them and see what they have there for you. CMH's website, first and foremost, will connect you with our field programs office and help you uh, contact the right personnel uh, to address any inquiries you have, for example, unit awards, campaign credit, lineage and honors, that sort of thing. Uh, and then some other uh, key websites there, the Institute of Heraldry, the guide ons of your respective units, distinctive unit insignia, uh, U.S. Tank and Automotive Armaments Command that actually makes the guide ons or, or flags or unit colors. And then U.S. Army Human Resources Command actually uh, controls unit awards and campaign credit, the, their awards and decorations branch. Uh, 
when you create a packet for a campaign award or a unit award, that packet gets reviewed by CMH for historical accuracy. And then the actual approval comes from U.S. Army Human Resources Command. And then the Army Museum Enterprise. We have over 50 some odd museums across the Army's various installations worldwide. And those facilities are there for you to utilize for any number of, of professional development events, uh, historical type uh, events, uh, planning staff rides uh, to do actually out in the field or even virtual staff rides. Um, the, these facilities exist for you to leverage, and we'll talk about some ways in which you can do that later in the briefing. This is a snapshot of our public-facing website, history.army.mil, and I'm going to take you through a series of screenshots now. Just I ask that you follow along in your slide deck, and it'll show you uh, how to navigate to our field programs page. So you start at the public-facing page, which you see here. You go to the next slide. You see the field historians button. You scroll down and click on that, and that will take you to uh, a field historian site that has a lot of best practices that your unit historical officers can utilize uh, to help them do their job better. This next slide is the CMH web portal, and this is an exclusive portal that your UHOs will need to, to gain special access to, and they do that simply by reaching out uh, to me at CMH, and we will grant them that portal access. And then if you advance to the next slide, you'll see that they'll come to a unit annual history reporting tool set. It'll give them access to an automated template by which they can construct their Army historical report. If you go to the next slide, you see the, the unit history tools button that they click on. And then a subsequent one that says to create a report to begin generating a report. And then the next slide takes you to the template. The actual template is there. It's it's uh, easily uh, navigated to and then you fill in the template as it directs you to do and allows you to link in pictures, PowerPoint slides, line and block charts, in addition to word text. And then when the template is filled out, it allows you to generate the report into a Microsoft Word document that can be staffed through your headquarters for your approval at your command level and then send the report up through the chain all the way up to, to Forcecom or whatever your higher headquarters is, and then ultimately to CMH. Okay, transitioning away from the template to the next slide where we talk about how CMH assists your unit historical officers. We're gonna obviously focus first on the units that are about to deploy. In the pre-deployment phase, we'll make sure that your UHOs are fully trained that they know how to work with our military history detachments, which are two or three main teams that reside largely in the reserve component. These folks deploy out forward with the units to collect information from across the theater of operations. So they may indeed uh, talk to your UHOs to arrange a visit to your unit to do some deep dive collection into documents and do some oral history interviews of key leadership and so on. So we'll teach them how to interact with the MHDs. We'll also talk about records management, how to prepare their annual historical report, and how to manage any possible artifacts that, that we might want to bring back to the museum system from our units that are deployed out forward. Phase two will focus on post-deployment. When the unit returns, we'll make sure that the annual history report is completed, that unit historical officers conduct their after-action reviews, lineage and honors determinations are made, uh, and any unit awards or campaign credit that the unit seeks to, to uh, submit a packet for to Army Human Resources Command is, is constructed and brought to us for our review and then sent forward to allow that process to work uh, through Human Resources Command. And then finally, uh, we can also help with unit day commemorations, taking a significant event in the unit's history and using that as a day on the calendar for you to, to essentially focus on the unit and celebrate the unit's achievements over time. The next slide talks about unit day examples, and there's a sample uh, memorandum for record that has been placed on, on Blackboard as well for you to refer to, where it gives you some examples of unit day type commemorations. If you were the 167 Armor Commander, for example, and you picked a 
uh, notable date uh, in September of 1918 when the Infant Tank Corps was serving the New Sargon campaign of World War I and a soldier within the unit won the Medal of Honor, for example. That might be one case in point where you might pick that day to be your, your unit day and, and celebrate the unit's achievements. Or maybe you, you choose something more recent, uh, a particular campaign or, or notable event in, in the Iraq or Afghanistan uh, operations that might be more proximate to the soldiers in your unit today. These are just some examples of how you can utilize history to celebrate the unit's achievements, to build that sense of esprit de corps and unit identity. The next slide talks about uh, how your unit history becomes U.S. Army history, the line and block chart here, and it shows how the history information flows up from your units. Again, our ability to tell the Army story in the form of official history is only as good as our ability to collect that information from your formations, from your battalion and brigade commands. And it starts with your UHO. So if you look at the bottom of the slide there, you see how this information is fed from the bottom up, from the battalion level, UHOs up through the brigade level, to division and core level, where we will have command historians in place, either civilian personnel or personnel in uniform who are performing that function to put together what the battalion and brigades have submitted and synthesizing that into division and core level histories and pairing that with the collections that come from military history detachments that are forward deployed with those units uh, worldwide. That information will ultimately be fed up all the way through to the appropriate four-star level headquarters, and then eventually to the U.S. Army Center of Military History, where our writing historians will take those unit historical reports as the raw material from which to construct the Army's official history. This next slide highlights the Army historical program itself. Your organizational history programs, your unit programs, are a part of the larger Army historical program. And we have the mission and vision that you see listed there on the slide. And it includes all components of the Army, the active force, the National Guard, as well as the reserve. And if you look at the little flow chart at the bottom of the slide, you can see there uh, the different parts of the Army historical program in institutional memory, uh, and support to the force. You're all probably very familiar with the left-hand side of the diagram that deals with military history as it's performed in your pre-commissioning sources, whether that's West Point, ROTC, or OCS, as well as in your professional military education throughout your career, whether it's at your bullet course, your captain's career course, ILE, CGSC, and the Army War College. Uh, you're, I'm sure you're quite familiar with that but perhaps less familiar to you is the institutional side of the house that deals with official histories. And that's where the center of military history comes in. And that's where your unit historical programs come in and those annual reports that feed into that to allow us to write the army's official history. And also the museum programs where we take in artifacts and, and utilize uh, the historical reports of the various units to tell the army in our museums so that we connect not only with, with soldiers th throughout the Army and civilians throughout the Army, but also the American public so that they understand and better connect and, and appreciate what the Army does in the nation's service. And then this next slide talks about Army museums and training support facilities. I already mentioned to you our 50 some odd locations throughout the Army's installations worldwide. And most recently, our flagship museum, the National Museum of the United States Army, opened on Veterans Day of 2020, on November 11th. And so these facilities are tremendous assets for you as commanders. And I highly recommend that you leverage those assets to be able to utilize these facilities for any number of professional development functions that you see listed here on the slide. You can do research and development. You can do classroom instruction, history and heritage type briefings, uh, staff rides, virtual staff rides, or plan actual uh, field visits to battlefields nearby. Uh, you can hold your organizational and unit day ceremonies at these, promotion ceremonies. The, the limit is only in your own imagination. And I recommend that you leverage not only the museums, but the training support facilities, big warehouse sized facilities that have 
a lot of macro artifacts, different equipment that's been captured and brought back from various theaters of operation and, and different pieces of equipment that the Army has utilized over time. All of these can, can enrich, inform, and educate your soldiers in what the Army has done in the past and give them an eye to how they will do things even better in the future. So to close this briefing out, remember, uh, your unit history is a command responsibility as laid out in Army Regulation 870-5. But more importantly, unit history is your professional responsibility to the current and future generations of soldiers that serve in the Army for however long they serve, whether that's one or two years or a career of 20 years plus. This next slide just gives you the key points of contact, starting with myself, Dr. Peter Knight, Chief of Field and International History Programs Division, and then the Chief of our Force Structure, Mr. Ed Bedesim. He's your guy for campaign credit, unit awards, and lineage and honors. Ms. Siobhan Shaw is our Chief of Library and Archives. She, she will have access to all of our records. And then Mr. Stephen Rohall, the Chief of our Historic Materiel Division, can handle any questions about artifacts or material culture type questions for anything we might bring back from our, our areas of responsibility across the globe. I, I ask that you consider me to be your point of contact at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. Let me be the point of interface for you for any questions that you might have. I am at your service. And ladies and gentlemen, as a 23-year veteran of the Army myself, I and greatly appreciate the awesome responsibility that all of you have as battalion and brigade commanders. And I wish you good luck and Godspeed in your missions and in your time in command. And uh, I stand ready to support you in that with anything we can do from the Center of Military History. I thank you for your attention.